Hi everybody, thanks for joining. I hope you can hear and see me. My name is Tamo Nakahara. I run the developer experience team at a company called Weaveworks. I'm really excited to see a lot of you uh, join for part two of uh, this series that we've been running uh, that we started two weeks ago and we'll hope to continue it every two weeks. Uh, that really helps give you an overview of the power of GitOps um, and also share some updates on um, what has been until about a week ago called the GitOps Toolkit, um, but is actually a Flux V2 for a lot of you who've been using Flux. I'm really excited to have Lee Capilli on our team, who's a developer experience engineer, joining and demoing a lot of these great um, topics. So if you've signed up, uh, you should get an email following this and Stacy on our team, who's our community manager, will make sure to include the um, video link for the part one that we did. Uh, and so uh, if you're looking to see these series, uh, we have lots of stuff that uh, we've shown before and that we'll continue to show. So for one, we wanna make sure that uh, we say hello to anybody who's been doing GitOps or is interested in getting started. Um, in particular, um, people who've been in our Flux community for many years, we really, really appreciate um, all the um, feedback that you've given and we're excited that you've been using Flux, uh, as well as having you join us on this journey as we've been completely um, getting Flux V2 into the, the next era. So I know that um, there has been a little bit confusion till now as um, Flux uh, has been kind of decoupled into what we were calling Flux V2 in the GitOps toolkit. Um, however, moving forward, we've renamed everything. Stefan on our team, if you know him, has been working really hard to rename. So I'm mentioning it here just because I know we've been talking a lot about the GitOps toolkit. And it still is something on which a lot of you can build lots of great stuff. So, um, you know, stay tuned, um, especially join us for uh, GitOps Days, which is coming up, where we'll be talking a lot about that. And if you're new to GitOps, well, thanks for joining. Um, hopefully you'll enjoy this series as we really highlight um, what our CTO, Cornelia Davis, has talked about as the four principles of GitOps. But as you go deeper and deeper, um, you'll see the power of GitOps as you start getting those various principles in place. So we know that everybody's on their journey and we really encourage everybody, if you're just getting started, even if you can get one of the principles in place, that's great. And there are lots of tools out there. Um, but of course, we've been building Flux V2 to really be the, the example and the tool that really gets you to the most powerful place and to really see GitOps as it, we hope it would be in the future. So as I mentioned, uh, GitOps Days was an event that we did in May. If a lot of you made it, uh, thanks for coming. And uh, you can see the videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, we have GitOps Days EMEA coming up on November 12th to 13th. So that's a Thursday and Friday. So don't miss that. Um, even if you're uh, not in the EMEA time zone, if you register, you'll get early access to the videos. So make sure you register at uh, gitopsdays.com. And if you have any questions, please let us know. So really quickly, uh, I mentioned that Lee, Stacy, and I work for a company called Weaveworks. Uh, we're the ones who coined, uh, our CEO coined the term GitOps. And um, a lot of that core for that was the projects that we did, uh, such as Flux. And now, um, as I mentioned, uh, temporarily called the GitOps Toolkit. Um, we've been founded on open source and hopefully you know our other tools such as Weave Flagger, Cortex, Ignite, and we've got many, many more. Um, but that's just a quick little bit. If you wanna find out more about what we do and a lot of the innovations that we have, uh, check us out at weave.works. So a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if this is your first time joining one of these, uh, welcome, thanks for joining. Uh, sometimes these are uh, user group meetings for people in the Weave community. Uh, we've been calling these ones uh, kind of community editions of our GitOps days. Uh, we started doing those when we we're planning the uh, May GitOps Day event. Uh, so in general, these last about 45 minutes, uh, sometimes shorter, depends on the questions. Uh, but if we go over time, then we have a hard stop at one hour. So uh, a lot of times, I think the last one too, we had a hard stop because uh, people had tons of questions and we didn't even get to all of them. Um, so we will um, 
uh, end at the end of the hour. And uh, if we can't get to your questions, we'll make sure to follow up by email. Uh, as I mentioned, we're really uh, lucky to have Lee Kapili, who's our developer experience engineer, who will be speaking today. Uh, usually we have these bits for Zoom, but I think today, these days, most people know how to use Zoom pretty well. So um, if you have questions, the main thing is to use the chat button and to make sure that you point it to everyone, because a lot of times people will uh, have conversations and answer each other's questions. So with that, um, just to lay some basic groundwork, um, if you're new and you're wondering, well, you know, how do I define GitOps? I think I kind of get a sense from the word. Um, we just make sure that we outline at the beginning. Uh, if you've gone to our GitOps days, you know, we talk about how GitOps is a, it's a methodology. It's, it's a paradigm. It's an approach. It's not necessarily a specific tool. Of course, our team works really hard to um, build Flux to be hopefully the best uh, tool that you can use for GitOps. But you know we're friends with many, many people in the GitOps community and there are a lot of uh, choices and it's really a lot of times based on what your use cases and needs are. And GitOps really can apply to everything. If you see the talks from our last GitOps days, um, you know it brings business value and can be applied to apps, uh, to uh, operations. And we even had some people who were using uh, Google Sheets, which we talked about is Sheet Ops, uh, as a way to do GitOps because Google Sheets have version controlling. So it very much can fall into that. And we see people doing whatever is the best tool for their needs, right? Uh, and so these are the four principles that uh, our CTO Cornelia had outlined. Again, you know, if you could start with any of these, great, we support you. Um, and then, you know, building it out and making changes will get you deeper, deeper and taking advantage of these four principles, which you have a system that's described declaratively. Of course, you're using version controlling and it doesn't have to be in Git. Uh, I know it's called Git Ops and a lot of us are using Git, but as I mentioned, right there, uh, you can use Google Sheets. Uh, as long as you have version controlling, you're really kind of practicing the principles of Git Ops. Um, and automation, if you heard the stories like, um, automation is one of the huge benefits that people got from applying um, GitOps to their methodologies. Uh, and then uh, you're using software agents, of course, um, primarily um, to get reconciliation. That's one of the key um, final parts of the um, principles of GitOps. And with that, as we'll share today, there's sort of a mini fifth principle that really a lot of it, you get benefits um, for security, which is, is something that obviously, especially enterprise companies uh, need to think about. So some of that is something that uh, Lee will demo today. So I'm really excited about that. So with that, I will hand it over to Lee. And as I mentioned, I'll be monitoring the chat channel. So if you have any questions, um, we'll try to find some bookmark places to, to answer them. Uh, and if we don't get to them, we will follow up by email. Hi, so, friends. Hey. <laughs> it's, uh, it's good to see everyone. Uh, awesome to reconnect with the community of Flux users. Always uh, so excited to, to get into the same room with people. Oh, Tamil, can you enable oh. sharing for me? Do I need to stop? All right, Thanks. stop sharing. There we go. Let's do this one here. So we are all devs. That's looking good, Tamil, as far as the screen sharing is going. Yep. Cool. So yeah, we like building things that we've, uh, we oh. want to make things that are, what's up? I apologize. So yeah, um, I forgot to mention. So if you looked at our meetup page, we had lots of things listed. And as I mentioned, we have a hard stop at the at top of the hour. So we probably won't get to all those things. So we're going to start with GPG. And then you're going to talk about, sorry, I have to go look at my notes here. <laughs> uh, or you can remind me. What yeah, we'll think? just do a Second. cluster API demo. Oh, that's, sorry, the cluster API yeah. demo. Uh -huh. And then if we have time, we'll um, show some stuff about with uh, around sealed secrets and SOPs. But the main demo is around GPG and managing remote clusters, which is really exciting. Um, and we'll continue to get through all the topics that we've, we've listed. We were a bit ambitious when we put out the meetup group, but hopefully you can stick around and it'll be helpful. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Lee. So the main thing that I want to do for the moment is I just want to create a new repo for myself. Uh, so let's go ahead and make a, we'll call this the, everything that I was doing for a second. 
Oh, oh, we don't need to do that actually. We'll just use this folder. Sorry. It's just kind of slow in my head for a second. So let's make a repository. I have a bunch of files uh, in this that hopefully will contribute to our demo. Uh, for the moment, let's just uh, add this kind directory and we'll add the config cap management directory. No, we don't want to do that. So what I'll be doing with this new repository is a flux bootstrap into a kind cluster that I have already started. Uh, so we have some kind nodes up and running. Uh, and I am going to do a flux bootstrap. And I need to, I want to bootstrap with GitHub here. So I'll need a GitHub token. Uh, I have a token on my machine already. It's the one that I use for hub, but I've added repo and key access to it. Hey Lee, so, someone asked if you could increase your font size a little. Uh, sure, that might be a thanks. little bit better. Yeah, cool. Uh, thanks for thanks for letting me know there. Sometimes it can be hard to read if you're like watching on your TV. So here I've exported my GitHub API token, and now we're able to do our Flux Bootstrap. Uh, so here I just want to let's create a new repository. We'll call this one just the. Uh, Cappy Flux demo about. And the path to the configuration directory that we're going to want to use is just prep some stuff for later. Cappy management, Cappy hyphen management under the config directory in our repository. And selfie box. Oh, this is interesting. Did GitHub just code? No, they're up. That's a really bizarre error message. Um, Built to create a repository, not found. I guess let's just make a repo really quick. Always have something unexpected happen uh, when you start asking. doing a demo. <laughs> I was asking, did you push the new repo? Uh, I didn't. I was expecting to just create one, but let's go ahead and do that. That's that's a good move. I like I like the suggestion. Kingdon says uh, you aren't an org. It says you aren't an. Org. Oh yeah, good point. Thank you, Kingdon. That's totally the reason. Um, we'll just, I already want to put some of this stuff in there. So I will do a, a create of this in my own personal one. I'm going to make this repo public. Uh, if anything goes wrong, you can uh, clone the repo after the demo and go fix the problems and submit a pull request. Of course, assuming everything is going to go right, then you'll just have an awesome resource where you can do this stuff on your own, right? So here we are creating a repo. And then we should be able to have already have this Cappy Flux demo repo created. I just used the hub command line tool for that. And let's bootstrap. And I might as well, um, yeah, I think the flag for this is personal. Uh, from Kingdon's suggestion, normally when you're interacting with the GitHub API, some libraries uh, expect you to be an organization. So we have this flag in here to switch it into the personal mode uh, to act on your own account. That is a great suggestion. Thanks. Um, so I already have 
uh, a repo with just a few things that I wanted to initialize in there. And then I'm referencing that repo that we just created under my GitHub user. And we want the path that we are reconciling from this repository into the cluster to be under config. And then I want a specific directory for the cluster that I'm reconciling. Uh, so a lot of people have been asking about a folder and directory structure. And I think that it's good to have a separate folder that's just for Kubernetes configuration. And then underneath that to have an independent folder for a cluster if you expect to be in a multi-cluster environment, which is very common these days. Uh, so let's go ahead and do remote repository is empty. That is because I need to commit. I don't want to do all those files. We'll just initialize the current settings. Cool. Push that up. Do origin. That's weird. I want to do main. Still getting used to this whole master main thing. Uh, struggling with the approach that I decided to take for this. I'm gonna fix our default branch really quick. Let's branches. Default branch main update. Understand. Okay. Nice. There we go. Thanks for your patience there. We're hooked up now. That means that we should be able to, to do this bootstrap command. <laughs> So uh, you can see just how easy it is to make a single repository. And then uh, once you have the repo, then you're able to get your PKI set up. We have an existing Kubernetes cluster that has uh, nothing really installed in it except for a cluster API control plane. And uh, I want to hook this repo up to the cluster and start syncing uh, and install Flux2. There we go. After several errors, I finally figured out what I'm doing with my life. Uh, here you can see that the Flux Bootstrap tool, in addition to hooking up my repo, there's some prerequisites, some infrastructure prerequisites, right? So what this tool is doing is it's applying a customization directory, uh, specifically with these settings kind of templated for me into the customization. Uh, there, you can do this declaratively if you want, but we have this uh, helper for you. Uh, and what it will do is it expands an installation of Flux, uh, all of the APIs that we need into the cluster, uh, and then creates a couple of deployments of the various controllers. So if you missed last week's talk, I know that somebody uh, was mentioning that there might be a few uh, folks who have joined us today. Um, last week's talk goes into why we split up uh, Flux into multiple controllers and what this wins for us and why we decided to use these APIs. Um, and so uh, this additional implementation, this additional complexity, it won us a great amount of observability and as well as the separation of concerns and the ability to figure out whether or not fetching uh, sources was not working or whether applying sources uh, was not working. You could see the reconciliation state. 
uh, separately. So here, uh, as soon as the bootstrap command is finished, it does do a health check on the controllers. And then also you can see that since I already have the repo, um, we've noticed that we're out of date. And it's because the bootstrap command uh, has, uh, as a consequence, updated our repository with new manifests. So hopefully this is a clean pull. Yep. So what we can see is that um, the flux bootstrap command added these toolkit components, uh, as well as a sync configuration and a customization for the flux system namespace to include these manifests for us. And if we look in our cluster, uh, we can see that there is this new object called a customization. So we have one customization in our cluster right now inside of the flux namespace, uh, or inside of the flux namespace that's syncing our flux system. You can see that this uh, revision has been applied. Now, if you, the customization is not the only thing that you need to be able to apply a source. You need to actually reference a source. So if I describe this resource, you can see in the, once we figure out how, where's the spec? Here it is. So in the spec, we actually reference a source re repository. There's a Git repository in the same namespace called Flux System. And we can look at Git repository. I need to describe, I just wanted to get those. So there is a Git repo, this one right here, in that same namespace that is also hooked up to the repo that I just created. We fetched the revision and it's synced. So this makes the source available inside the cluster and a separation of concerns from fetching the source versus what we exactly want to apply. Um, if we also look at the customization spec, uh, we can see that I'm not applying the entire repo. This is actually where the path is specified and what interval that's done. So I wanted to talk today a little bit about um, adding some trust and some secure granularity uh, to the way that you reconcile things into your cluster, right? We've just opened up a portal. We've allowed anything in a Git repository to apply to our cluster using a cluster admin uh, role in this case, right? The first repo that you sync to the cluster uh, will often be a very privileged repository. And um, because I am a good open source citizen, um, if you look in my GPG uh, configuration, I have uh, trusted the keys from GitHub and I have my own key that I can use to sign commits. The reason that we would want to sign things is that you can actually set your git config author to anything. Gosh, what's the best way to print? I don't know. Get core, I think. User. I can never remember how to use that command, right? But you can, you can set these things to anything. So here you see I've listed a signing key and this gives me the ability to say, hey, when I do this, I actually want these e this email to match the email inside of this signing key. And I can affirm that who I am is really who I say I am. Now, we have a little tutorial um, after you've got you know, all of your SSH authentication set up, uh, most of these things are taken care of for you by the flux bootstrap command, but you can do these things manually if you want uh, or have a need to do so because you're not using GitHub, GitLab or some supported provider. Um, but if you want to then modify, so here we have um, a verification of what we're pulling when we have the source. We can stick that on the secret or we can, we can put a secret in the cluster that lists all of the public keys of the people that we trust to be syncing a source into the cluster. And then when that source is synced, it, we only allow that, that commit 
to update the Git repository in the cluster if there are people in this list uh, that are trusted uh, for that commit. So let's go ahead and set this up. All right, as an administrator action, uh, I want to export my key uh, into, I'll call myself StealthyBox, um, put that in there. So let's do in, uh, it's export. Yeah, we want to armor that in the ASCII format. And then, yeah, I'll need my key ID. So just using some autocomplete here, but this is the key ID from the list. And then I'll put that out to a stealthbox.asc. And I'll just put that in my home directory. Cool. So now we can kubectl create secret generic. Uh, and I'm guessing we probably want to do that in the flux system namespace. Yeah, that's not mentioned here in the guide actually, but we'll go we'll ahead and do that the right way. Oh, I see you can reference. Yeah, this is default, but we want to um, actually add some verification to the customization inside of the Flux system namespace. Right, so this is the one that we actually want to add some verification to. It's the, it is the big repository that we want to be verified. So I will make a generic secret inside a flux system and I will call this admin keys about, or uh, admin public GPG. And we will add some, uh, we'll add a key called, I can just do C. Is it, I think I might have to do this. Maybe. I might not have gotten that syntax right. We'll just do, cool. So if we uh, just get that secret, just to make sure that I made it correct, flux system. We just want to, so that was created in the right place. And I just want to check that, yeah, it has my bytes in there. And it would even be fine to read what's in there because it's just my public key. So you guys can all verify who I am. So we have that secret in the cluster. This is just an administrator action. Now, if you had another GitOps repository already syncing into the cluster, and say you were using something like Mozilla SOPS uh, or Sealed Secrets, you could put this key into the cluster um, th as a secret value using some other chain of trust. Uh, but because we don't have that established yet in a brand new cluster, we only have one repo syncing. Uh, if we want to affirm the commits in that repository, we have to do it this way first. Um, I guess as an alternative, I just realized that what I said is wrong. You could totally put that secret uh, into the repository that we just were using. In fact, why don't we just do that? So, um, well, just ignore that for now. I'm going to move on, uh, but hopefully that made some sense. This is. How do we get into this directory? There we go. Uh, so we have our GPG key in the cluster. Let's go ahead and modify the way that the cluster synchronizes. So I am in my Cathy management directory. And then if I go into flux system, and we did a pull, right? 
Oh, I see. Sorry, I changed the name of the Git repository. So, like, yeah, I need to save that. Um, yeah, here we go. So if we go into Flux system, we have this GOTK sync. This sync YAML has two objects in it. It's the where the Git repo and the customization come from for the Flux system namespace. Here we're applying this folder to the cluster, and we want to verify mode GPG. Yeah, it should be. Mature verification, verify mode head, right? We need to verify the actual commit that we're going to. This is, this is the only mode that's uh, valid right now. And you can imagine that we could add more behavior here later. And then we want to reference the secret key ref that we created. that secrets inside of the cluster. It's called admin public GPG. And then it's not going to be necessary yet. But I can look at my diff. Check that this is the actual thing that we want to change. We're changing the synchronization of the flux system for this particular cluster that we have in our config directory for our repository. This repository is syncing to the cluster, it's already being applied. So, in the spirit of GitOps, uh, I can just set up commit. Verification for pre installed keys. Go ahead and push that up to the repo. Now, if we were using a webhook configuration, this would synchronize super fast to the cluster. Uh, but in this scenario, that's probably not going to happen uh, without us poking the reconciler. But we can go ahead and check. Uh, let's just go look at the Git repositories in the cluster. And currently we're fetched on the revision 9DA56. But if I look at the log for what we just pushed, oh, wow, that happened super fast. There we go. Oh, that's right. I think maybe the bootstrap. No, that doesn't, that's not true. Oh, well, anyway, um, that's that happened super fast. That was kind of lucky. There we go. Um, so if we check our customization, then we have, oh, I guess I misspelled something. Here's a great example of um, why fetching and synchronizing are different problems. So apparently I misspelled uh, something in our Git repository API. Uh, here I'll use the kubectl command line tool to figure out what my typo was. Uh, if I could just get the explanation of the Git repository. Spec dot verify. No, oh, it's just supposed to be ref, secret, secret ref, not secret key ref, my bad. We'll just go ahead and fix that really quick. Uh, sync. And while we're at it, we'll go ahead and 
That's odd. That, that is very concerning. How did that happen? Code. It's pushed up. Let's go ahead and just check our customization. This is still erroring, which it would be expected in that short of a time thing. There we are. So let's. This will be a. Another for you Flux users who are migrating um, from Flux CTL and Flux version one uh, to what will be Flux two. Uh, as we continue to work on this, we have a little bit of a preview, but the expected UX for this is Flux Reconcile, a Git repository, or sorry, a source, which is a Git repo. And the source that we're trying to poke is the flux system. No PGP signature found for commit. adding a little bit of documentation here. So the, our uh, head commit is not signed because for some reason I was having an issue with my PGP key. Uh, so let's just try to sign another commit. Add the readme. I think it was already added. Commit. I'm not sure why uh, my maybe I have to set my GPG why to or just use a different um, terminal. This might work. Kingdon was adding that he's seen this error. Did I have this error when I use GPG TTY? When yeah. It's when it's unset. When it's unset. Okay. That's that's what it is. So my I don't normally use my VS Code terminal unless I'm doing a demo. Um, so my TTY must not be set properly. But if I go uh, and use this terminal instead, uh, we'll go into the Capi Flux demo. Thanks for the confidence check there, Kingman. You're so awesome. I should be able to finish up this commit here. It's time to fix reconciler. I think like that. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> There we are. Push that up. Oh, can I catch it before it reconciles? Customizations, get repositories. So previously, the customization had applied this. And it was saying that there was no signature. Log. Yeah. So let's let's poke the reconciler now. Reconciler. Get flux system warning. There we 
we are. So the signature that um, that I was actually able to push to the repository after I fixed my TTY, um, that was, this was the previous commit and this is the new one. And that's actually signed. And if we do our get on both the customization and the Git repository, uh, then we've now applied this revision successfully. We describe the customization should no longer have any errors. So uh, as <laughs> we have an opportunity to see uh, how this is much more debuggable than previously would be, you know, you would be doing something like kubectl and flux, you know, logs, f, and then probably like scaling and the like deleting the replica set or something, you know, to try and figure out what what is wrong with flux. So in this case, what you can see is that it, you're getting very granular error messages. <laughs> so um, here you can see that it liked. Uh, what I did when the source was signed. And then we also had an example of it not wanting to proceed, uh, saying that our Git repository was not ready because the PGP signature for this commit uh, was not found. So we can block the reconciler by, um, we can block the reconciler if the commits are not verified. Uh, assuming that you have some secret provision in the cluster, uh, either through an administrative action or committed as the very first commit to your Git repository uh, that contains your public keys thing. So we just have one here, but as we add more team members, we could just keep adding to this list. And those could be uh, commits to your Git repository, right? So really, really great here. If you're not practicing uh, using the signing commits. Uh, if you move to a GitOps workflow, this can be something that you could talk to your team about adopting. Uh, keep in mind that it does typically change the workflow for a developer uh, in that you saw, you know, I have to have a, my GPG TTY set. Uh, so I'll probably add that to my bash RC. And I have to also, uh, anytime I do a commit, I need to do a, a dash big S. Also, if you do a tag, uh, you'll have to sign with a small s. So just get workflows changes uh, as you adopt GitOps if you're trying to do a key verification. So uh, it's a good thing that we allotted a lot of time for this for me to fumble through getting a repo hooked up uh, to show you the GPG features. Uh, the reason that I did such a complicated, complicated repo setup is I wanted to preserve a bunch of these files because I have a little bit of an ambitious uh, moonshot here. I'd really uh, like to share some unique things that you can do with the new Flex APIs uh, with regard to reconciling and not just reconciling to the cluster that the controllers are in, but also uh, from a configurable way to other clusters. And this could potentially compose well with cluster API. Um, a disclaimer is that I know that this technique and this methodology is solid and does work. Uh, but as we've seen today, apparently I'm making a lot of typos, so we may have to debug and hopefully I can get to uh, something that not only demonstrates exactly what should happen, but what, what actually does happen. <laughs> so what I have um, got a bunch of new files in this repository. Uh, you can see I have scripts that help you know, just uh, set up your kind cluster, make sure that it's you know, uh, network setup on your local machine is going to be conducive to creating child clusters from the same cluster. The kind config, you know, it has a Docker socket mounted. So we already have this cluster created. And then I did do a cluster CTL init uh, infrastructure Docker. This was the last command that I ran on the cluster from cluster CTL. So uh, I did look at doing a declarative config for this inside of this Cappy namespaces folder, but I deleted them because they were having a um, some sort of issue with the Cappy system. Uh, but if you do a cluster CTL init infrastructure Docker, um, 
this is one step to getting the cluster ready and moving this to a declarative config is probably a, a problem for future work. Um, development with cap D uh, is frequently changing because it's not a supported production configuration in the way that it used to really be before. Uh, but CAPD is a very powerful tool for building and playing with systems when you don't have easy access to lots of fancy Kubernetes as a service providers. Uh, or if you just don't want to pay money or you can't get sponsorship from your boss to give you an admin account to keys to the cluster or keys to the, you know, uh, cloud account, then uh, CAPD is very useful. Uh, so cluster API provider is going to allow us to use a cluster API management cluster on our machine. I'm just using a kind cluster to create child clusters that are backed by Docker machines. Uh, if you're not familiar with cluster API, that's totally understandable. Uh, it is a hot but very new project. Uh, it's picking up a, a lot of steam. And um, Weaveworks, as well as many of our other um, small and large uh, open source friends uh, are all contributing to it in various ways. Uh, specifically, we're very involved with cluster API, API provider AWS. So I am going to add this new folder. Uh, this is a trick that I've been doing. We, we may improve this UX a bit, but if I want to predefine a bunch of stuff that I also want to land in the Flux system namespace uh, before this folder exists and before this customization exists, or if I don't want to use customize, I just make another folder called Flux system dash apply. Um, it's just another way to get creative about your folder structure. So in here, there's a helper script that generates uh, the this file right here, child cluster YAML. And um, if we look at this, you can see there's a bunch of like networking subnets and uh, domains defined. Uh, it's creating a cluster API cluster as well as the uh, backing provider Docker kinds necessary to bootstrap a Kubernetes Kubernetes control plane on that cluster, uh, a bunch of certificate stuff uh, so that you can actually connect to the thing uh, after the API server starts up, Docker machine stuff, and a machine deployment template. So a uh, bunch of cluster API objects, very verbose, but we just use this command to generate them. Uh, I take that declarative output and then put it into my GitOps repo. Uh, I'm going to manage the identity and creation of that cluster from the CAPI management uh, cluster. And then from that, let's go ahead and get this up already to see if we can get the demo started. So I will add see what files we have here. These are some scripts we have. Go ahead and Yeah, we'll, we'll leave that one in there too. Uh, we have like a couple of uh, customizations. There's this child apply. Here's the cluster that we were just talking about. We're going to add that to the CAPI management control plane. Just have some scripts and looks to be a pretty good connect to me. So remember that we are only applying commits uh, that are signed. I'll just go ahead and set my GTY here just so I don't have that same issue. And this is a, an important concept because this commit is going to create infrastructure, right? Uh, so we want to make sure that we have a pretty good audit log going for us. Uh, maybe you trust the way that people are using GitHub, but um, just it's really going to depend on your organization and the way that you work with your teams, whether or not signing commits is valuable to you. you know? um, so here we want to create a cluster and bootstrap kindnet plus pod info. So this is the intent. Oh, we have the same error again. Oh, I didn't, I didn't export it. That's the issue. Push that up. Should 
should reconcile very quickly into the cluster. But, oh, we'll just poke it anyway. So we are at 6a. That's the commit that we just updated to. Let's see, these things are very quick. Let's go ahead and check the customizations, make sure uh, that that actually applied. So we can see here now we have a pod info customization and a child apply customization. I didn't show you this one yet. This one's the interesting one. So child apply is inside of the flex system namespace. Every minute at the path config slash child, I want to synchronize this path to an API server using kubeconfig secret ref name child kubeconfig. Now, where does this secret come from? This secret is supposed to hold a kubeconfig that can access another cluster. Uh, it needs to be self-contained, so it doesn't. We don't support like using exact exact helpers and that kind of thing. This is because of the security and execution model of Cluster API. Uh, but we could potentially uh, like figure out some things later. Cluster API uh, controllers produce kube configs that are compliant with what needs to happen here. Uh, and then this path inside of this Git repository, it's the same one that we're already synchronizing to the cluster using the GOTK sync config. So this goes to our own cluster from this path. And then this child apply uses this repo at this path to this cluster using a kube config. This is provisioned for us by cluster API ideally. Now that's been applied for us a little bit. So I just want to check up um, on a status of thing. So here, this is a really good sign. It says that uh, inside of the Flux system namespace, we have a cluster API cluster called child that is provisioned. If I actually look on my machine uh, for my Docker host, because I had a Docker socket mounted into my uh, CAPD management cluster, um, I should be able to see those nodes running. Yeah, here's a bunch of uh, child Thanks. Oh, these nodes are old. I guess I already had an existing cluster that it reinvented. Cool. And then um, if we were to get the kube config uh, of that cluster, so I have a script here in the root of the repository. Um, it's cappy get kube config. Just have to change the namespace there because we did a rename recently. This right here needs to be flux system. There we are. Then I have this child kube config file. I can check the, just get a bunch of pods using that kube config. Specify report. I guess that cluster is not up and running yet. Oh, I see. Those that's those aren't running. I created a collision. Sorry, friends. B child control. So the uh, cluster API controller was frozen. Or if I uh, can just no, deleting the cluster is not going to work. How much longer do we have? We have about five minutes in the hour. Yeah, a little bit of time check. 
I think the only thing I could think of to do uh, would be to do quick find and replace uh, anywhere that says child we could totally replace it uh, with child two. Let's make a new commit where we delete the child cluster and create a new one. Add copy and config. Child could config. Commit, sign it. Delete child cluster. Uh, great job, too. Just check up on the uh, customization to see which revision is applied. Sorry, I was just checking all namespaces here. And Fluxnips. That's the old commit, so let's go ahead and just poke the reconciler. There we are. And now if we look at the customization, then we have the new revision applied, uh, which means, ah, I see. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, that folder. So we went from child to child to and find. Cool. Reconcile. There's, there's that. Yes, don't get confused. Here we are. We have the child to load balancer and control plane coming up. That's a really good sign. That means cluster API is working. Uh, this usually doesn't take very long to get up. The API server should become available rather quickly. Uh, we'll go ahead and just run our get kubeconfig script again. So that would be this script right here. Now we can see that we have child2.kubeconfig. So if I try to access, say, the API server, we'll just look for pods uh, inside of the specific child2kubeconfig. And this is looking pretty good. There you go. There's KindNet getting reconciled. And oh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> so, thanks for everyone's uh, patience. We actually were able to get to a working uh, demo here. Um, <laughs> so, hopefully, hopefully, the significance of what just happened I mean, I did fumble through a bunch of things, but just to be clear, what I did, I I had a bunch of leftover infrastructure. You, you may have had this problem as an operator before. Um, I had a, a, an existing child cluster that was shut down and those names collided with what I had in my Git repository uh, because I copied these manifests from a different demo that I was doing earlier. And um, so what I was able to do with GitOps and cluster API uh, was I just renamed all of those manifests uh, using my editor um, and then renamed the directory uh, that I was trying to apply because that happened to match up with the manifest that I got in part of the rename. So that was the bug that I had. And as soon as I committed all of that, um, I have a topology for applies set up inside of the management cluster that targets the child clusters. 
right? So here using the kube config that is generated by cluster API, this is a detail that we weren't able to really get into. Uh, but if you look at the secrets inside of the flux system namespace, um, then there's all of these CAs, you know, there's like control plane secrets, there's etcd secrets, there's a proxy secret, here's that kube config. This got created by cluster API when we applied the child cluster YAML uh, for our new child2 cluster that was created. And then if you actually saw, um, if we look in the namespace, the first one is actually in the process of being deleted because since we renamed it in our repo and we had prune enabled on our synchronize configuration, uh, we were able to actually delete the infrastructure. It's in the process of uh, obeying our command there as well for what we did to the commit. So um, ultimately what happened is with a single commit, we we deleted the old cluster, renamed it all, and then created a new one. And then with the applies that were failing because the cluster wasn't existing, like we were able to install pod info and kind that into the new cluster. So looking at the get pods of the child two, uh, you can see that we have a couple of uh, pending pod info pods. We have kind net installed and running. Uh, this would not have been there if we did not have the manifest uh, for that inside of the child to kube system directory. That's where that came from. Right. So this directory got applied to this cluster, as well as a separate customization from a different Git repository. Uh, this one right here. Cool. So well, this, uh, this repo is public. Go check it out. And um, if you we'll uh, have share it in the follow-up email, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so yeah. we're we're two minutes over. But um, actually, I think this is kind of a fun way. Thanks for being patient. But we can rename this uh, using GitOps to troubleshoot or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, as I said, we have a hard stop and we've been three minutes over. So thank you so much for sticking around with us. Um, hopefully it was still useful. Thanks for being in the chat. We will follow up by email um, for any questions that we did not get to uh, during the talk. So um, make sure to join us for GitOps days, November 12th and 13th. And we have planned another one of these on November 30th. So uh, stay in our meetup group, which we'll add to the follow up email. So thanks so much to Stacy and Lee. Appreciate it very much. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone.